Welcome to another great author interview here at the Poison Pen Bookstore, uh, virtually, of course, uh, during this whole pandemic and, and non-touring situation. Today, I am really lucky to have an author not only who I consider a friend, but uh, one of my favorite writers of the thriller and horror genre. Uh, I'd like to give a big warm welcome uh, to Weston Oaks, who is here to discuss and talk about his two latest books, Alien Infiltrator and Bone Chase. Welcome, Weston. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been too long. It's been about, oh, I'd say a good year and a half, two years since I've seen you. The whole COVID year, we don't count. That's that's just that's just that's like a leap year that just didn't exist. That's exactly it. It was one day, one after the other after the other. It was crazy. So so let let's just pretend that didn't happen, okay? That's absolutely right. But um, I'm really lucky because um, Bone Chase came out back in December, and I think that things were a little crazy. It's always that holiday time period. We didn't get to discuss the book. So we set up some time uh, this it month. It was a tough because... time for a book to come out, like the end of COVID. And, you know, nobody wants to promote anything. Nobody wants to, you know, have any book signings. And basically, I was just totally dependent on fans and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a tough time for books to come out, you know. It was. It, and it was a strange time to do it. So at the end of this month, Bone Chase um, comes out in paperback. Yes. Schuster, um, the Emily, I believe it's the Emily Bessler imprint, right? I could be wrong. It's, it's, it, well, it was Saga. Saga imprint. Yeah. That's right. It's hard to remember who's who and where's where. And Well, they, they, they reconfigured a couple times over the last two years. So, you know, they're. Well, this is, this is awesome. So Bone Chase, um, is is a thriller in the lines of kind of a James Rollins esque or Doug Preston Lincoln Child um, uh, novel uh, focused around uh, some really great mysteries, specifically the Nephilim, um, which are the um, giants of the Bible. If 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 you're reading things through correctly, um, and a lot of conspiracy theorists and different groups uh, like to study the Nephilim specifically because it's such a neat and weird portion of the Bible that discusses what Nephilim are. Were they angels? Were they a combination of angels and man? Uh, they were described as giants. And um, I really, uh, I, and so you've written a thriller kind of around the history and the mystery of the Nephilim. Can you give us a little bit of a, some insight onto Bone Chase? Well, I was lucky enough to have James Rollins read it and uh, give me a great blurb. Um, and uh, I think it's on the cover. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a fine, fine man, a great author, you know. Um, but, you know, if, when you're a working author like I am, most of the time you're contracted for books. So um, I'm always contracted for, like right now I'm contracted for four books in the next two years I have to write. And, and that, that's just the business. And I love it. I love that part of the business. But there comes along an idea that you want to work on. And you, you, that's, that's your side hustle. And so my side hustle for three years was to work on this idea called, at first it was called Bone Rush, and then, then they called it Bone Chase. And it was the idea that, what if giants really did exist? They just do, period, they exist. And they've and they've hit they've been hidden because let's face it, if a giant was to walk walk down the street of New York, everybody would start either trying to kill it or worship it or both. Because I mean, it's just such an it's just such a I mean a 14 foot, a 20 foot, a 70 foot tall creature. It's 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 a it's a human kaiju, right? I mean, people would people wouldn't know how to react. So they have to keep it silent. They have to keep it private. And of course, I, I have the Council of David, you know, which is based upon the David and Goliath, and they're against it. And then I have, and then I have the, uh, then I have the six-figured men. So I have, I have a lot of different groups who are um, um, working to this. But 
what really started it out was the idea about this this out of work mathematician who gets a box and he and he gets in the box and says don't open this box and of course the first thing you want to do is open the box and it says mm -hmm. you've opened the box but don't go any farther and of course it goes farther and then once it goes farther it gives him a list of rules um which is you know don't don't go on the internet and, and type this don't go to this web server don't do this don't do that and last of all don't trust the six fingered man mm -hmm. and it goes from there it's hard to go into a lot of great detail about it because i think then we move into spoiler territory but one of the things that i really enjoyed about this book is you're taking us all over the world and the suspense does not let up um things are pretty calm i would say on the first two pages and then after page two uh you really start ratcheting up the suspense and moving um moving your poor character through everything because at first you know he's he's not really wanting to be a part of this adventure and a little confused on why he was the person uh sort of selected out of his entire family to get passed along this this treasure, this secret that his father had recently discovered. Um, and uh, you you put him through some some hell, that's for sure. Pat, it's it's interesting because you know, I write a lot of military fiction, you know, military horror, military thriller, military sci-fi. And I did I wanted this person who is as unmilitary as possible to be the hero of this novel. I wanted somebody who's just a regular Joe, somebody who doesn't know anything about anything. He's, so he's, a, he's an out of work high school math teacher from Nebraska, right? Yeah. And, and, and he's thrust into this to be the hero of the novel. And so I wanted, I wanted that to happen because I wanted to now have the narrative go through him. So I thought that was really interesting. And I like the fact that you're, you are putting him through hell, but you're putting him with some pretty competent people that are gonna keep him, keep him alive, hopefully throughout this book um and it is interesting because west when i i read your books i was expecting your main character to be um ex-military somewhere along uh his background and discovering that he was a regular joe uh was a lot of fun um but you really know military very well too and you write military extremely well i think you're one of the top-notch um military fiction writers in the united states i mean uh, your Task Force Ombra series, um, the, uh, oh my gosh, Spring Sky is one of my all-time favorite uh, adventure horror series where you combine both adventure and horror, and you really know soldiers. So was it exciting and a little difficult to think, okay, I'm so used to writing these soldiers, I know soldiers really well, you've worked, uh, you've had a career in military before being a full-time writer, was it was it tough getting into the mindset of somebody who wasn't a soldier or who did not have that military background and trying to figure out how to keep them alive throughout this entire novel no it was it well no it wasn't um because you know at heart none of us are soldiers i mean at heart we're all just regular human beings we're all just regular people you know i just happen to have um another side hustle which is being a, being a a soldier um and I've, I've done it for 35 years so far and the thing is is um it's really easy to tap into being a regular person because i mean i'm surrounded by them my my whole life but i cheated in this book remember because his his uh his his um co-protagonist um shani is a reserve military intelligence officer uh -huh. who um, kind of helps him through some of the um, more ingenious wickets as as it goes along because i wanted to also not only have a um a normal joe protagonist but i wanted to have i wanted to reverse it i wanted to have instead of instead of a um um somebody saving the princess i wanted the princess saving somebody so 
So, so here we have it where, where, where the female ends up saving the protagonist over and over and over. Shanae is one of my, or Shani, sorry, is one of my all-time favorite uh, female characters. And uh, I, I, I would, I would, I'm glad that you said the princess saving the, uh, saving the hero, because I think that, you know. I did that intentionally, yeah. absolutely, because I mean, I mean, I have, I have a wife, a mother, I have a daughter, and they're all strong people that I totally want to represent them in books. Absolutely. Uh, your wife, Yvonne, who's another great horror writer, um, uh, she's a pistol, you know, and she's okay. a great artist as well. I've seen some of her artwork that she's done. Uh, she does a really great job. Um, and uh, it's always nice when you're, you're present because both you and Yvonne usually come together. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, we miss, we miss that portion of it. But yeah, Yvonne, I could see you um, pulling in some characteristics a little bit from Yvonne into Shani a little bit. Um, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and also the thing about Bone Chase is that you note that I have facts all the way through it. You do. And these facts are things that have been published. Mm -hmm. They're things that are part of history. For instance, in, in the um, in the 19 teens, um, it's a fact that the Smithsonian got rid of and destroyed all their giant bone artifacts. Interesting. It's a fact. It, it, it comes from the smithsonian.org website in, in, and they talk about it, but they won't go in depth and say why. So there's, there's a lot of these different things. And up until the 1930s, it was really common in newspapers to talk about fighting um, giant bones and and, um, and evidence of giants all the way through um, America and South America. And then after that, it was suddenly, it's like nothing. Suddenly it's like UFOs where, oh no, if, if you believe in that, you have to be stupid. Right. So I'd love to play on that. I, granted, it's pseudoscience because you can't prove it, right? Um, but one of the reasons you can't prove it is because a lot of the evidence has been destroyed. It's one of those interesting conspiracy theories um, that periodically comes up. And one of the uh, very beginning uh, chap in the very beginning chapter that you're talking about, you're talking a little bit about uh, Art Bell and George Norrie, who are really interesting to listen to. And of course, they're always going to bring up the subjects of the strange and the different. And whether or not you agree with them or you disagree with them, if you think that you know some of the people that they bring on are genius or crackpots, they always have an interesting discussion. And I I liken this book to um, you know learning about it like what you would learn from listening to somebody on George Norrie or Art Bell um, and discussing the Nephilim and who were they or who could they possibly have been or who were these giants. Um, and what is the theory behind this? And um, I'm wondering, was it, was it one of those episodes or was it something that you had read that sort of triggered you and said, bingo, this is what I know. This is, this is the hook. This is the interesting um, myth, legend, whatever you want to call it, that you wanted to explore. So yeah, Art Bell and um, George Nuri um, are, they run the Kingdom of, of Nye, which is um, uh, a an AM radio station that goes from, it's coast to coast AM, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, I mean, if you're driving at night through the desert, that's what you listen to because that's all that's on, uh, mm -hmm. unless you have, you know, Sirius or whatever. Um, but it's really entertaining because of all the things that they talk about. Um, but no, it was, it was the first, the first thing that got me was the whole Smithsonian. I read about how they, they di destroyed dinosaur or their, their, um, giant bones. I'm like, destroyed giant bones? What? First of all, I didn't know you had giant bones. Second of all, why would you destroy them? What made you decide to do that? Because it's not like they took up more room. I mean, you could destroy all, all of the, I don't know, other things, but giant bones seem to be pretty rare. 
So why would you do that? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it almost it almost begged the question that they were ordered to do it. So at that point, I just I just began buying some books. And and if you look at the back of the, um, the acknowledgments, I acknowledge a lot of a lot of folks who I who who I used um, for, for research. But um, what's interesting is that when you look at when you look at the various versions of the Hebrew Bible way back in the day, um, most of them most of them were written in Greek at the time. And so what happened is a bunch of Greek scholars got together, uh, seventy of them in fact, and they decided how they were going to uh, recraft all these different versions of the Old Testament into into one Old Testament, and they chose to take out the word giant in almost all cases and replace it with messenger. And then later on, that messenger was, was then called angel, right? But in the beginning, it was always giant. Interesting. So, so we're talking the first two or three or 400 years of people creating this, it was giant. And then it was only later on that the that angels existed. Yeah, and you know, and then there's the whole idea of what these giants were, and the the premise of what the Nephilim were, and a lot of, and it's uh, debated by scholars, but a lot of these giants were considered perhaps the combination of both human and alien, or not alien, angel. Uh, I'm thinking of, or uh, or they could have preceded man, because the fact is is you know genesis 6 right said there were giants on the earth in those days mm -hmm. and it's it's fascinating period there were giants on the earth in those days that's it's what it says i mean if 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 you're a biblical scholar and you decide not to believe in that well i guess you're picking and choosing then aren't you <laughs> that's for sure so what was this um what was this research delve like? Was it, were you reading absolutely everything that you could get your hands on? Were you great. reading? It was great. I spent so much time. I mean, I, three years of research just to write this book. Um, and um, I had so many hundreds of pages of notes. And it wasn't until, and this is all, all in between, you know, I'm, I'm working on other projects like Bernie Sky and Dead Sky and the Ombre novels and Seal Team 666 and all this other stuff like that. And then when I had a break in my schedule, I, I went, okay, so, so it's time to write the book. Who's gonna be your protagonist? Um, Del McCune has kind of an interesting question for you. And he asks, was the six-fingered man in, in uh, Bone Chase related to the Coast to Coast episode on December 3rd, 2008, where Steve Quayle talked about the six-fingered giant found in Afghanistan? No, it's not. Um, you can tell my friend Dell that it's not um, that at all. Um, because um, um, polydigitism, um, uh, six fingers um, is an indication of nephilism. Is it is an indication of giantism? It's always been that way because most of the times when they find giant bones, the giant bones have six fingers, and so there's actually people who um, have who regular folks who are born with six fingers, and uh, those folks. Um, a lot of times we'll we'll get that 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 last digit cut off, but the fact is, is that that's a sign that they're related to nephilims. Interesting, really interesting. So, the, were you talking to researchers? Were you talking to people who were really interested in this? Was this mostly was it mostly interviews or was it mostly um delving through through books and and articles and things like that 
no, as a you know, as a as a as, as a college professor, I I I I love doing research. I research has always been my thing. I mean, if there was no internet, I would still love it because I would just live in a library and I would have stacks of books beside me because I just I love the idea of just just diving down through something to get to something else and um it's it's amazing there is there is a website uh, a facebook site called real giant stuff um that i followed and in i i name checked them in the novel mm-hmm. and i used them in the novel um and and i've since sent the um one of the one of the owners of the Facebook page, a copy of the book, but I haven't received a response. I I hope that they they took it as a as a really good homage because I didn't I didn't denigrate them at all. But the the whole idea is that if you go to Real Giants on Facebook, I mean, every day they're they're populating information about you know different things that are found or different or different or different ideas, and it's it's super interesting. But once again. I get it. It's pseudoscience. It's not pure science, but I mean, there is there is there is once a time to where we didn't know what oxygen was. We just knew we could breathe, and now we know what oxygen is. So maybe maybe there'll become a time in the future where um, we'll uncover an actual real giant. Wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, right now people are fascinated yet again on aliens right? Aliens are just about everywhere where they're hitting the news and talking about these mysterious unidentified flying objects. And um, people are really intrigued by that. And I think that, um, I don't know if if the pandemic has gotten us to start thinking a little bit more about maybe some things that we just decided to kind of put aside. And, and it's, it's fun to think and sort of, of obsess a little bit by, but I think that we're getting some, I think it's, I think it's these sort of subjects people are getting really interested in again. I I think think so. Uh, You know, a lot of people make fun of people who believe in UFOs or, or whatnot. And, you know, there's a lot of science against it and there's a lot of belief against it. But I just saw a post, I think it was yesterday, from Terry Jacobs, an old friend of mine. And she said, disbelieving in UFOs is the same thing as taking a spoon in the ocean and taking a sip of ocean water and just and, and not believing in sharks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that's a good analogy. That is a really interesting analogy. Um, yeah, I mean, we simply don't know what's out there, and it's fun to explore these myths and the legends, and uh, there's reasons why they're out there. Uh, there's reasons why people wrote them down and wrote down this information, whether it was allegorical or whether it was literal, we'll never really know. Um, but I always find that really, really fascinating, and I love it when thrillers get in there and talk about this allegory, and they talk about you know, you take a stance and you say, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I'm going to run with it. And one of the things that I found was it was so clear you enjoyed what you were researching that this entire book is a complete and utter blast. It is so much fun to read. One of the, one of the, one of the grace points I made in there, which I think is, is, is I could have done a better job with, but I, I, I liked what I did, is, you know, these this information was passed on to many people. And so when, when my, my main character is reading on it, he can see the comments that are made from other folks, right? About, about how, about how no, oh no, this is wrong. Oh yeah, this is true. And, and how people, the other people who have read this and followed this trail, who have done the bone chase, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, commented on it. And, and I, in that, that, that took me down a Facebook realm because I mean, in real life now, everybody comments on everything. Mm-hmm. So, so that was kind of my, my, my way of, um, you know, making it almost a social media esque type of thing. It's sort it is interesting. Cause I mean, you can't get away nowadays without having a thriller and especially one where you're going to 
implement technology and not bring in social media. Social media is just, it's too big. I mean, here you and I are talking to quite a few people on, online about your latest book. It's so integral to our discussions anymore and how we keep track of that information. It's kind of cool. And you know, you know, you talked about 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 thrillers and about how how um, readers really like the esoteric. I mean, that's why they like Preston and Child, right? Right. That's why I like James Rollins. I mean, I mean, all three of them are just amazing what they do. And I just heard that. Um, um, who is it? Um, it's going to star in the movie version of the Monster of Paris, which is um, um, speaks fluent Spanish and fluent Italian. Um, starred in Desperado. Starred in Thirteenth Warrior. Not Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas, yeah. He's going to star in that movie, and I'm in. And 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 when I saw that, I'm very excited because I, I love him as an actor. I mean, we just watched Thirteenth Warrior the other day again, which is based on on the Michael Crichton book, you know, Eaters of the Dead. I was really um, intrigued by the fact that um, so many. I was just thinking about this. So many of your books have been optioned, and you've gone through the pathway. Of, of this. So SEAL Team, for instance, um, Task Force Umbra, I think, had something attached to it, I think. It's been a while since we've talked about it. Um, but um, I do want to ask a quick question. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I had to look up the name of the your Aliens book as well, not Aliens Infiltrator, but the game that is going to be based off of it. Um, <clears throat> so you've you've been attached a lot to these different Hollywood um, uh, films or they've they've bought off of them. And I think part of it is because your books and your thrillers are so cinematic in scope. Um, are you hoping to see one of these release out into the theaters at any or on uh, Netflix or Hulu or whatever streaming source or television? Come on, Pat. What kind of question is that? Come on. Oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. I mean, you know, as I tell people um, pretty much everywhere, I'm a kid who grew up in a trailer park a long time ago, you know, and, and I have this vision of a four-year-old me standing there with a with a book bag and and he's supposed to be a really happy person but he's he, he looks like the most miserable child in the world and i keep thinking of that person every time that i i start writing something mm -hmm. um because he would be so impressed about what he had become That's um nice. and it's it's hard work you know i'm not saying that you know i, I didn't work hard it's just it's just you know I came a long way from that place and to even be optioned for a movie and to be talking with the rock staff, like I have been for a couple months. Um, <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So, so yeah, of course it would. It's, of course it would. It's such a challenge. I mean, I think I'm thinking back to CJ box with big sky, which became a huge hit and how many times that he's been, those books have been optioned and bandied around, you know, both the Joe Pickett and the, that series until finally something happens at just the right place at the right time. Um, I feel like um, Bone Chase for you is the right book at the right time. Because yeah. I think that these books, it's such a great thriller and it's at a time where people are wanting to kind of delve into the esoteric um, Preston Child, James Rollins have become incredibly popular. And I think that you fit in really nicely into that group because all, all three of you or four of you are such incredibly strong thriller writers. And it's not your first rodeo, but you've always been a really great writer. And even your horror, like um, uh, 
Burning Sky, for instance, I think it's mostly thriller with some horror in it um, versus, uh, you know, where some people might say it's all horror. I, I feel, you know, you've got so much going on with your, your soldiers and the adventures that they go on that I feel like it's more of a thriller. Um, so I've got, I just wanted to say, I think that you've uh, kicked this book really out of, the, uh, hit it out of the ballpark. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I really, um, um, hearing you say that means a lot because, uh, you know, you see so many books coming across your table not not only working in libraries but working in the poison pen that you know you know you're very discriminating taste i love books i love reading so um and sometimes my favorite books aren't always uh everybody's favorite books but i you know if you can do something unique and interesting i always think that that's that's something where it should be uh nodded to um Tori Eldridge asked a really good question, and Tori's um, author of the book *The Ninja Daughter*. I don't know if you've yep. read Tori's book. I'm a, uh, I'm a very good friend of Tori. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to give Tori a quick nod and new uh, and a shout out here. Please do. And she wants to know if uh, *Bone Chase* is going to be the start of a new series that you're going to be doing. Well, Tori, like anything else, it depends on the publisher. Um, I would love to continue um, uh, Ethan's journey. Um, I left it open at the end to where there can be more, uh, especially with um, Susie and her little remote control bumblebee. Um, so yes, I do want it to be, but it's, it's all dependent upon the publisher. You know, It's all dependent on sales and, and what they wanna do and, and everything else. Um, I did sign a two book deal. So, so we'll see if the second book is gonna be the sequel to this, that'd be great. So the incentive of, of listening to Weston I speak is that I hear the poison pen Weston's kind enough because he's, he's way, 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 way down South Arizona. So it's right now it's a little too crazy to get him to come on up and sign books. He's agreed to sign um, uh, some book plates. So any of the books that you buy through us, we're going to be putting in a book plate uh, signed by Wes. Uh, no doubt about it that when the next book comes out and we can actually have them physically up here and it's a good reason to do it. Um, and it's not 116 degrees like it is today. Um, you know, you can get the book signed. Um, and these are special, um, special SEAL Team 666 book plates too. Nice. So, so they're, they're, they're one of a kind. And uh, actually for both books. So the other book, um, as much as I hate to pull away from um, Bone Chase. No, let's talk about Aliens Infiltrator. Alien Infiltrator. So this yeah. is, um, and I had to look up the full title and I apologize here. That's why I looked down. Um, this is going to be the prequel or Alien Infiltrator is a prequel to a game coming out published by, um, uh, uh, let's see here, now it's coming up on my PlayStation now, Cold Iron Studios uh, called Aliens Firestorm, Fire Team Elite. Yes. This is going to be a third person um, uh, cooperative survival shooter game that involves a group trying to stay alive uh, while aliens are attacking them. So I think this is kind of an interesting conundrum that they gave you. They're, here they are giving you this high, high, uh, high action video game, and they're saying, write the prequel to, to what's going to be happening, where it's going to be this multi-group player, um, uh, multi-group player, uh, you know, environment. I was, I was trying to come up with the right word there, but um, what was the, how did this come about? I mean, this is, I mean, it's cool, but I, I'm like, I, I'd be a little scared. So I've already worked in the franchise before doing short story. Um, and um, I've, uh, Steve Sapple is the uh, editor at Titan, um, uh, the acquisition editor for um, especially aliens and you know, a lot of other things like that. And um, he and I had wanted to work together in a novel for a while. Mm -hmm. And we just hadn't been able to find the right project. 
And um, he emailed me about this and talked to my agent and we talked and, and we decided, okay, let's try this one. Um, but it was a challenge because um, this was the first book where Disney had bought Fox. So not only did I have to work with Fox, I had to work with Disney and I had, and I had to work with the gamers. Mm -hmm. So I had to, and I'd work with Steve, you know, we had, so I had, I had, I had four mothers to this, to this work I was doing and I'm the only father and I'm, and I'm, and I'm trying to make this work. So it took us about three months to get the, um, to get the um, outline to where everyone, everyone liked it. Just because, you know, we had to uh, socialize, socialize things with people who sometimes weren't used to working with, with authors like me. And they didn't understand that, like, if I give you an outline and I, and I give you like a paragraph and I say, this is what the chapter is gonna be, they would ask questions well, like what else it's like it'll be in the chapter you just have to trust me and and so eventually they came around to the point where they trusted me and it and it came out to be a great novel i mean it's selling like blockbusters and the game i'm told is just a beautifully visual game and um what it is is my game or my my, my book is not is is, is is a setup it's a full-fledged novel and at the end of my novel is where the game begins. So, so if you want to, if you want to uh, play the game, read my novel because not only are there probably Easter eggs, right? But I was able to create two brand new aliens that are now in the um, Alien franchise that have never been there before. You know, it's sort of interesting to think of Disney owning aliens because this is you know <laughs> this is this is an adult concept here um they own star wars i mean oh, less, you know they own everything yeah. right now so yeah less uh less um less mickey you know maybe you'd have a mickey mouse version of a uh <laughs> of an alien now that i'm thinking about it um xenomorph is what the word i was I, trying to xenomorph. um <clears throat> By the way, it's starting to thunder here. So if, if we start getting a little statically, it, it's it's because we're going through monsoon. So I apologize to everybody out in the in the wild. So if if we lose you, we'll we'll know too, just in case, because sure. whenever we get a monsoon, you know, you always have the option of losing the power, all that fun stuff, uh, at least for a little while. So writing by committee is always a challenge. Um, it wasn't writing by committee; it was outlining by committee. Okay, so but still a little bit different because you're working with the probably did you work with the writers primarily of this game who were kind of yeah playing and storyboarding versus the actual yep. game makers themselves yep and well you know well the writers of the game are also the ones who actually you know do do all the work on it so um, um, there was there was there was a lot of interplay and a lot of really good work that we did together that you know brought together because once again it's a military i decided to make this a military novel and for anyone who hasn't read alien aliens infiltrator um it's basically the office meets aliens uh because because i had never seen a novel before or or a movie before in the aliens franchise deal with Waylon yutani and and how corporate they are and the bureaucratic structure so i wanted to do the bureaucracy of it so it's definitely the office where you have you have all these different different um groups working not together but cross purposes with each other that are trying to you know maintain or obtain the same thing so um that's what people tend to enjoy about the novel um, more than the blood and guts, because let's face it, it's an aliens novel. So, you know, when you get halfway through that, you know, shit's going to hit the fan. You're going to have some it. survival horror elements to it. Um, but that's part of your bread and butter. That's part of what keeps you kind of going and flowing throughout the, uh, in, in your, in your horror novels. So, um, when you're doing that, um, I mean, what what did you do to kind of make sure that al these aliens kept really fresh 
fresh for you, fresh for the audience? So Palis Station, which is where everything takes place, is a remote testing location for way for for way you to figure out how they can weaponize alien technology, alien blood, alien DNA. And they use black goo to do it. And so, and they also, um, some of the scientists have used, have used some of the um, local um, fauna um, and their DNA to inject into the aliens, to the xenomorphs, so that they can figure out what type of effects it would be because they're always looking to weaponize uh -huh. um, because that's where their money's at. And they create several different crazy aliens that can do some things that you don't want aliens to do. Um, um, but at the heart of it, it's, it's really a story about the people, right? It's about, it's about, the, it's about the ex, I have a group of ex-Colonial Marines who work on the station and they have formed a group of common concern uh, because they're worried about what the scientists are doing. And then when shit hits the fan, they get together and they end up trying to save everybody. And of course, like most of my work, everything deals with PTSD um, because I have it, um, most people I know have it. And I think it's important to address it always in a positive manner. I still have to say that one of your finest bits of writing, uh, Grunt Life, and you go into, you really go deep into the headspace in that book and going into uh, PTSD and the, the impact of it. And I'm still, I still remember that scene. After all of these years, I still remember that scene from that book because it was so darn powerful. Um, and- That's my favorite opening line to any novel I've ever written, I think. The opening line to, to Grunt Life is, it was my love of movies that made me jump off the, the, the Vincent Thomas Bridge. And that's because, that's because um, interesting, interesting tie in to Aliens. Um, the uh, Aliens director's brother, Tony Scott, is the one who jumped off the bridge to kill himself in 2008. Interesting. Interesting. Um, pretty sad too. Don't know. He, I, I think he had he, he had brain cancer, and I, I I can't tell you anything else about why he wanted to do it. But I mean, this is the this is this is the director of Top Gun, True Romance, um, um, Man on Fire. I mean, I could just 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 name them just over and over and over. So many great movies. Yeah, and. Speaking of that, Aliens is one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, the second one in the series I thought was so good. I really loved it. And it is really kind of, uh, when you get down to it, it's basically a video game. You know, they're, Game over, baby. Yeah, game absolutely. <laughs> Three people or four people really trying to survive the entire time. And will they get through it, won't they? Um, and it's also probably the most high action of them. Uh, and that's how I was introduced to Aliens. Um, what did you, uh, I mean, in terms of, of that franchise and keeping close to it, were there things that you were required to keep or put in, or were you pretty much given free reign other than, you know, having the committee kind of check through your, your outline? No, once, I mean, it, it took three months to get the outline squared. And once I got the outline squared, then, then I had to follow that outline. Um, um, and most of it had to do with, with how I dealt with xenomorphs or, or the corporation Wei Yu. Um, as far as the humans, nobody really cared. I could, I could do whatever I wanted with them. But I mean, the franchise is based upon Will and Yutani and, 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 and the xenomorphs. So I had to be true to all that. And of course I had to make sure that it was in line with the chronology of all the events that happened. So, you know, you have to be aware of that. Luckily, there's a huge Aliens Wiki online. And um, I found out that some, gosh, let me, let me go over here so I can get some credit. So 
as we're waiting here. Um, for those of you, oh, there, he, there we go. I found out that Lee Ribbencomb Wood published this. Nice. A oh, tech wow. manual, right? And it was published by Titan Books. And once I found that out, I, I emailed Steve. And I said, dude, I need this. And he said, no problem. <laughs> Two days later, I had it. And, and it was a, it was a great resource material because it laid out, you know, it lays out all the weapons and all the armor and everything else like that. So I don't have to like watch the movie and go, what's the weapon called? What, oh. I think I think you and I have both heard of horror stories from writers who've written in the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. So my guess was that it was going to be sort of the same sort of thing where you're given you know, like one of the authors that we had interviewed was literally locked in a room with a script with an armed guard and they were only allowed to read through the script once <laughs> so that they knew what was going on so they could do the novelization of the movie. Oh my gosh. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, trying to commit that to memory or trying to, <laughs> trying to do that. I, what, were they as strict in, in terms of that, in terms of aliens, or were you just having to keep the project sort of mum? Uh, I, I had to keep it mum. I couldn't, I couldn't mention it. Um, I mean, there's other projects, franchise projects I'm, I'm working on right now that I can't talk about. Yeah. Just because um, the publisher wants me to keep it quiet until they are able to announce it first. Mm -hmm. And so I just have to respect that. And that's... And that's what you that's what you have to sign on to when you do uh -huh. work for hire. I mean, the thing about a work for hire novel is you're not getting paid the most money, but sometimes you're able to work on a franchise that, that you really want to work on. And I love working the aliens franchise. And I mean it's a I mean, shoot, I mean there 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 are some times where I'm like, well, I would pay you to work on this, but don't tell anybody. Oh, wait, we're on live. So yeah. Scratch that. Well, and it becomes canon, right? Once you write it, it does. A lot of this, this part, I think that's why a lot of writers enjoy writing um, these novels within these universes, is because now um, a lot of the publishers and a lot of the movie houses and everything say, yep, this is now canon as part of this universe and this universe's history. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a real honor to be able to help kind of group shape it, but you've you've put your stamp. It's almost like, you know, being Emperor Oaks of the uh, Infiltrator for saga, right? For a day, Emperor Oaks for a day of the alien universe. Yep. Exactly. Um, so the que for me, my question is, did you get to play the game? Did you get to go in there and do a little bit of? Uh... So, so I'm 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 in discussion with Cold Iron Studios, and they're actually going to send me a, a a copy of the game so I can play it. I'm told the game is wonderful. Um, I've been on um, I've been mentioned on Twitter a bunch of times um, um, as the author of, of of the prequel to a game which everybody's loving. So so it seems to be a really good, really awesome game, and you know I'm. I'm not above to, you know, sit down with a glass of wine and shooting a bunch of aliens all night long. I mean, I mean, that, that, that might be kind of fun. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I know that I actually am planning, once I, I read, um, I'm not all the way through Alien Infiltrator, but I'm a good portion into it. And I'd like to um, dig in a little deeper and then pick up the game afterwards and get some buddies together online and, and, and do a little co-op. Uh, gameplay there. Uh, so I always have a great time doing that. Now, in terms of that, um, uh, I was just thinking IGN and some of the other um, uh, game journalist locations have uh, been talking about this game quite a bit, and I guess that it's getting really good pre-reviews, so hopefully it gets a great review when it comes out, because that always helps book sales, which is sort of funny. Um, but this is also how, as booksellers, we get to sell your book to people who are interested in the alien uh, universe or who are gamers, because then we get to talk to them and say, you know what, this is this is the prequel to uh, the next Aliens game that's going to be released. And, and you know, I, I do feel I do feel fortunate that Steve asked me to um, do the prequel to a game like this. I mean, yeah. there were I think 
four alien books that came out this year. And he could have asked me to do any one of them. And mine was the only one that was a prequel to a game. So yeah. um, whether or not he knew that I could, I could, I could deal with the bureaucracy of it or not. Um, and, or he just randomly chose me. I don't, I don't know, but I, I appreciate the fact the editor, you know, you know, allowed me to work on this project like this because it is selling really good. Would you think though that because the games industry has become a billion dollar, billions of dollars, they make more money than movie houses, that that's going to give you more exposure as as a writer than your traditional movie now? It's, I mean, it no, seems like I don't are... think so because it's a different readership. It's a different readership. It's a different buying community. Um, the people who play games don't necessarily read. True. But everybody watches movies. Yeah, I can see that. So um, the, the only reason people will buy this book is the idea that there's Easter eggs and that there's hints for the game so that when they get in the game, they can have a better chance of, you know, going through it. And, um, and, and there are, and there are some, some things in the book that, if, that, that once they read it, they'll be like, oh, hey, I do this, or hey, if I see this come up, maybe I should do X, Y, Z. Sure. That's smart. That's smart. That is that is a good little nod, and it, it honors the game players as well. Um, Wes, uh, somebody in the audience is, we're, this is a, a digressive question here, but uh, he says, I suppose somebody has already asked this, but what what is that biogra biographical thing on the wall? And what is it? It looks like this. Yep. Yep. That this just um, so that was a um, an article from a local newspaper when um, The Rock decided to option my uh, novel Seal Team Six Six Six, and and it's just something to wear when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling like I I can't do anything. When I'm feeling like, you know, I totally suck at writing, I turn around for a second, I look at that and I go, well, maybe I'm not so bad. And, and it gives me that just little spur of, um, um, of optimism. And it, 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 you know, just jacks up my ability just a little bit. So um, in Zoom days, it's been interesting because I've, I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings with different businesses and different things like that. And a lot of people ask me about that. And I never really thought about that, um, being back there as being anything other than something for me, right? Um, because I don't have like I, an I love me wall anywhere in the house. And a lot of people think it's like, well, this isn't an, an I love me thing. No, it's a, it's a reminder. It's just a reminder of, of just a moment in time to where um, I was able to achieve something, and um, that's still going on. This the whole thing is still working, and I hope to achieve more. What I'm really impressed with is we we have discovered, um, you know, that a lot of writers got stymied by the pandemic, and I think it happens. Right, this was just monumental. Um, and you happen to come out with two books in a year during one of the toughest times in, in our American history. Three, and because I wrote a book you don't know about this with my agent, so. The third, excellent. We'll call it The Secret Third. Um, it's, actually and, called Red, it's actually called Red Unicorn and it's in the giant series. Um, nice. So, um, and it takes place in 1984 Argentina. Uh, during the Falklands War. So we're so, going to see something new coming out of it. That's incredible. So it sounds like you've kept yourself motivated and you've used your time during this pandemic pretty darn well. Well, you know, I, I also teach college. Um, I also am a life coach. Um, there's, just a, you know, I, I, I do a lot of different things. And um, I mean, writing is a passion. I mean, I'd love to do it. I mean, right now I have, like I said, I have four books due in two years. I have uh, three books um, 
contract that John Mayberry and Jonathan Mayberry and I signed together um, that we're doing for Atheon Books. And then I have another book coming out from um, from Solaris. And then in I think September, uh, you'll like this. So uh, I have Preacher's Daughter Save the World's novel coming out. Preacher's Daughter from Burning Sky and Dead Sky. And this is called A Hole in the World. She has left Boy Scouts team is now as part of Special Unit 77. And um, she gets delegated to go to um, England, Great Britain, because there's a missing city. Oh, that's cool. A city just disappeared. And nobody, and most people are like, there's no city that, that disappeared. What, what do you mean? There's just nobody, know, they don't even recognize the fact it's gone. And the same thing happens in America. And so they have to get to the bottom of it. And, okay. and this is a kitchen sink fairy with weapons novel. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm glad you're bringing us back to that world because I really enjoyed that world. And Rita's daughter is a great character too. Yeah, she is. Um, and I do have to say that your website is a wonderful resource for those who are up and coming writers, for those who want to um, learn the craft, you give a lot of sage advice off of your website. And we've actually done some really wonderful, you've done, you know, we turn people over to your website actually when they're wanting to learn how to write because you've got a lot of great writers. And it's clear that you enjoy writing because you continue um, producing books that I, give me a ton of joy to read and are clear that you enjoy writing what you're writing. And uh, that's that's exciting. It's exciting when a new book comes out because you can tell, you can tell a lot. Um, Marlene Sch uh, Schma says, you've done a Ghost Heart with your wife. Any more collabs in the, in the works? We have a collab in the works that we can't talk about. You will, you'll find out about this collab in about three months, but it's going to be wonderful and everyone's going to be excited once they find out. And uh, I've been squinting throughout this because it, I've got funny light in the, the office. And if I put my glasses on, you just see the screen in my glasses. So I don't think that that's really... Uh, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, let me see if I have any more questions here. And, um, and a, a hello to Marlene. Let's see here. Let's see. And I think we've got, I was just going through the questions, making sure, um, you know, you've got so many great comments on this, and as you, I can't continue, see any of the comments because I'm on, I'm on like the different feed. So you're on the different feed. You're on the Zoom feed. Um, Marlene says she has a big smile. Hi, back at you. Um, when we uh, post this, if anybody wants to ask further questions, of course, let Wes can always take a look and and respond on our Facebook Live. Um, so Wes, we've got a lot of secret stuff coming out from you pretty soon, which is awesome. <laughs> You've written two incredible books and uh, Bone Chase comes out in trade paperback at the end of the month. Alien Infiltrator is already out. You can get them at any bookstore, but you can, we're one of the few places where you can get a signed book plate from Wes that we're going to be- the only place. The books. You're the only place you can get that. Excellent. I, well, I, I didn't know about special bookshops in Sierra Vista or something. No, we don't have a bookstore in Sierra Vista. Wow. I know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear that. But there's other places you can go so long as you pick up a book through West because we want to see more and in, in wherever you buy your books, uh, we want to see more in Bone Chase. I would love to see you uh, write more in the Alien series as well, because that's been a blast. And I can't wait to see what else is coming from you. Wes, we're at our hour, so I better let you go. Have a, Thank you so much for doing this and taking the time to talk about two books. No, I Pat, like I appreciate we, you and the Poison Pen, you know, taking the time for me. You know, it means, it means a lot to me because, you know, the Poison Pen is such a, it's such a big bookstore. It's such, it's such an important bookstore in the industry that, um, um, being able to be part of 
any any sort of book signing or eat virtual or even in person is, is 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 a big deal. So thank you. Oh no problem. I I've got to say that we wouldn't be uh, we wouldn't be here without you. It's mutual. Uh, we wouldn't be out here without our greatest customers. We really do have the best customers in the world. Um, and it, for me, when I come in and work at the front of the bookstore and get to talk with people about books, it is the best joy in the world. And uh, I get to put pe books in people's hands and and watch them smile. So that's, I, I, I love that. It just, it, it makes you feel good. So um, I appreciate you providing books that we can we can hand easily and comfortably over to customers to know that they'll enjoy. So before we go, I want to point out that um, an author that you turned me on to about five or six or seven years ago, Richard Lang, Lang is yes. going to be doing a, a book signing, a virtual book signing at your store here in about two weeks, right? Right, exactly. And Just I'm, like what we're doing here now. And I'm really excited about that because Richard's a former Marine and he writes, he writes much in the vein of Don Winslow and, and he writes really good Southwestern Americana um, visceral uh, suspenseful thriller type work. And i um, I haven't read his new book, but I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm, and I just want to give Richard a, a shout out because um, I'm a huge fan of his, and we've exchanged a few emails over the years. And uh, and I just want to make sure that he gets some love. Absolutely, and uh, maybe you'll pop on to our Facebook Live signing. I will. Say, hey, because that's always a lot of fun when we get to see familiar faces and familiar names and, and we get to shout out your name a little bit too. Um, so yes, and we are doing a, 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 another program with him. And I know that Barbara, she's been the one who's read his book and she really enjoyed it. So we'll be having signed copies of that one here as well. Um, Wes, thank you so much. Um, I will see you probably in a few months for the next book. Um, so, and don't be a stranger here. And everybody, and thank you it. so much for watching and sticking around with us today.